a doorway in Microsoft. Hey, Ron, your office must be down here somewhere. I smell watermelon. A conference room at General Motors. Hey, what's up with Karen? She just needs a good. At home when I was 12. Ooh, those homosexuals are an abomination and they're going to burn in hell for their sins. My underlying response to these situations, shock, anger, isolation, rejection. But my in the moment response, pull back, quiet, don't say anything. Later, share the experience with a family friend or a confidant with whom I could share my unbelievable shock and hopefully get some acknowledgement. My name is Ron Simons and I'm a storyteller. In fact, I created a company whose mission is to develop, finance, produce, and share stories about communities that deal with situations not unlike those. We seek to tell stories that will enable audiences to connect, communicate, and act. When I came up in Detroit in an automotive family, I wondered what I was going to be when I grew up. I went through a lot of, lot of, lot of occupations. I was going to be a priest, I was going to be a doctor, I was going to be a veterinarian. But I worked really hard, and I studied hard, and I graduated from Columbia University right here in New York City with a degree in computer science. And during that time, it was a very tough market for computer scientists, but I had to get a job. Because I was an only child from a low-income family and the first to ever graduate college. I felt an intense pressure to succeed. I became a mission-based, focused overachiever. So I got this great job at Hewlett Packard being a software developer, but unbeknownst to many, I'd also started my application at the Yale School of Drama. And I started my application to the Yale School of Drama because deep down, that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be an actor, even like going back to high school, where I had this you know, star turn as sharecropper number two in Finian's Rainbow. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, I know. But that's a story for another day. So I didn't finish my application to Yale because, well, one, you know, actors are not known for having consistent paychecks, and two, it was Yale. I mean, the number one acting school in the country. There was no way I was getting into Yale, so I accepted the job at Hewlett Packard, and the next week I get this call. Hi, is this Ron Simons? Uh, yes, it is. Hi, this is Catherine. I'm the head of admissions at the Yale School of Drama. Oh, hi. I'm calling because, as you may know, the application's deadline is passed, but we'd like to extend the deadline for you. Wait, what did she say? <laughs> I mean, this caught me completely off guard. I mean, I, I just got thrown into chaos. I started thinking, oh my God, does this mean that I can actually get into Yale? So I got nervous and I did what I do when I normally get nervous, I start talking. So I launched into this long diatribe about being from this low-income family and how my mother and grandparents were elderly and needed financial support and how I was gonna be the breadwinner and how HP just offered me this job and I had accepted it and on and on and on and on and on. And as my mouth was moving, my brain and my emotions were escalating, an avalanche of thoughts and feelings. Oh my God, I think she's telling me I can get into Yale. But what would I tell HP? I can't afford to go to Yale. I wonder if I can get another student loan. Is she offering me guaranteed admission? <laughs> and after a while, I realized that I stopped talking. The autopilot had left the building. And that's when I heard her say, well, I'm sure you're going to be very successful. I'm sorry you won't be joining the fall class, but I wish you all success. And she hung up the phone. This was a pivotal moment in my life. Because my brain told me that HP was the right decision. My intuition was a split decision. My collaborators, eh. I talked to one person about my desires in acting and applying to Yale, and I should have talked to more. I should have told them about my dreams and my desires. But not having done that, I was left with my own decision. Now, a footnote, I in fact did take that job at Hewlett Packard. I did not call back Yale with a changed heart. But my intuition finally concluded, as I stared at that wall for what felt like an hour and 15 minutes, that one day, not that day, but one day, I'll be an actor. 
And after what I thought was a very successful career in computer science, I decided I needed to focus on the second component of my Trinity formula, which was my intuition, which told me it was time to pursue my acting dreams. So I applied to, got accepted in, went to, and graduated from the University of Washington Professional Actor Training Program. And at the tender age of 41, I became an actor. <laughs> Unfortunately, oh, thank you, that's very sweet. Unfortunately, after a few years, I started feeling that I really wasn't excited about the kind of roles that I was auditioning for or the projects that were being greenlit. My first audition for a television show was for a pimp. The second one, a drug dealer. And before I went on stage here in New York in a musical where I played a fat, suicidal black man, I started asking myself, wait a minute, blah, blah, blah. Are these the kind of stories that I want to tell? Are these the kind of roles that I want to see promoted? I realized that I could have more impact in the world by not just acting, but producing and creating work. You know, one of my first films that I produced was called Gun Hill Road. It's about a Puerto Rican dad who comes home to philandering Dominican wife and a teenage son who is transgendering. This was an untold story. But the thing is, is the dads really responded to this story because at its core, it was the story of a father and son. We just chose to tell the story of a family in crisis through the lens of a Puerto Rican dad and his son who yearned to find his true gender identity. So what we did after we created that role was to then decided we need to do this more often. We need to go out and tell all kinds of stories that we felt could change the world, that could address the homophobia that I experienced at home, the racism that I experienced at school as well as in the workforce, the sexism that I had seen in everywhere around the world and in the places that I had visited and lived. So at the end of the day, what we decided to do was go beyond just film, and plays and television. We decided that we were going to expand our repertoire. And that's what we do today, right? Now let's go back to that story of the executives at General Motors in the conference room who felt they knew what Karen needed. My, my brain told me that this was like very inappropriate. My intuition told me these were not my kind of people. But my collaborators, I didn't talk to anyone in that room. And I wonder to this day, what might have happened if I had said something? What might those other men in the room have said? Would they have been outraged? Would they have been taken aback? Would they have been embarrassed? You know, sometimes when we face injustice, we feel like we're alone. But ultimately, we're not. You know, the communication that we resist can close the door for learning, for growing for healing. Newer generations are consuming content in all kinds of ways. Young people are learning life's lessons through YouTube talk shows where people talk about their lives while tasting hot wings. <laughs> Stories are being told through the blockchain, through curriculum, through podcasts. The Everything is evolving, and we as arts and entertainment professionals have to evolve too. We have to tell the stories that will impact generations to come. See, I use the shock and the pain and the hurt and the embarrassment that I experienced to motivate me to tell stories that I hope to change the world. Now, you've heard my tale. What's your unique lens to a universal story? You don't have to use my formula, but figure out a way to tell your story. Go beyond your comfort zone and the circle of people you know, no matter what your profession. Because by enabling communication, we enable the possibility for change, for growth, for learning. It gives us the opportunity to share, to converse, and believe in a better future. And at the end of the day, it gives us the power to change the world. Thank you.